Hi, I'm here today with author and comedian Sarah Benincasa, and Sarah is going to be nice enough to read part of her new book, Agora Fabulous, Dispatches from My Bedroom for us. Go for it, Sarah. Okay, this is from the introduction. When I was 17 years old, I met the hottest guy in seriously the entire world at a free academic summer program run by the state of New Jersey. The camp, held at a public university down the Jersey Shore, was called the New Jersey Governor's School on Public Issues and the Future of the State. It doesn't sound like the place to find Adonis, but there he was, a dreamboat straight-A football captain named Kevin, whose extracurricular activities also included coaching little kids' sports teams and volunteering at a convalescent home for nuns. When he turned 17 that summer, he was young for his grade, his mom brought a cake with a car on it because he and his twin sister were finally going to get their driver's licenses. He told me once that his sister was the only person he really trusted. She and I had the same first name, except hers had an H at the end, and mine didn't. He was very nice, too nice to be true, and the other students at Governor's School, type A student council brats mostly, wondered what his deal was. You couldn't be that smart and that hot and that nice and not secretly be crazy or a werewolf or something. I found it deeply disappointing that he failed to offer to relieve me of my virginity. And at a certain point, his plastic perfection started to weird me out. Oh, I totally still would have let him put his fingers down my pants, but a strange kind of resentment arose within me as well. As a funny, read insufficiently hot girl, I wasn't privy to the mating behaviors of popular alpha males, but I was savvy enough to intuit that I was never going to be Kevin's girlfriend. Eventually, I did find a boyfriend. He played tennis and was good at making out. Plus, we liked a lot of the same books, Philip Roth's Goodbye Columbus, chief among them. Governor school ended and we all went off to our respective high schools to start our senior years. Kevin entered a new high school in a new town and was immediately nominated for best looking, most likely to succeed, and best personality, a stunning trifecta of high school laurels. I heard about it and thought with slight annoyance, of course. Then one night in the spring, he walked into his garage, filled a bottle with gasoline, brought it upstairs into the bathroom, locked the door, poured some of the gasoline down his throat, soaked himself in the rest, and lit a match. When they broke the door down, he was still alive. He still responded to his name. The end took a little more time in coming, less than a handful of hours, but if you measure time in pain, I imagine it felt like years to him, because indeed he was still there, after the fire, still conscious, still feeling everything. I think he wanted it that way. Not for him the quiet chemical sleep of too many pills, not for him the instant violent relief of the shot to the head. If his death taught me anything, it's that when life doesn't hand us the punishment we think we deserve, we are wholly adept at delivering it unto ourselves. In the weeks that followed, I heard rumors about things he had supposedly done, and things that had supposedly been done to him, but they were rumors only, confused teenagers' attempts at explaining the inexplicable. I have always regretted not going to his funeral. We were never very close, but maybe it would have made more sense being there, seeing his family and all his friends. Maybe he would have made more sense. I've thought of him often in the intervening years, through friendships and love affairs, college and graduate school, times of joy and times of breakdown. I don't know if I believe in God. I don't know if I believe in heaven. I don't know if I believe that Kevin is watching me or that he hears me when I speak his name. He didn't watch me often on earth, so I don't know why he would feel the need to do so from any other plane of existence. Maybe I should have worn tighter shorts the summer I knew him. What I do know is that Kevin was very much on my mind during the times when I walked myself to the edge of the abyss and stared down, feeling my toes curl over the lip, seriously considering giving myself over to the yawning absence of anything. And so Kevin has been with me in one form or another, perhaps just as a thought, on numerous occasions. Wow, that was pretty intense. Thanks for sharing that with us, I oh, appreciate it. You're welcome. Once again, I'm sitting here with author and comedian Sarah Benincasa. Sarah, thank you so much. Thank you.